Hey, this is Rachel Bayman, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who plays bluegrass. My guest on Bluegrass Jam Along this week is Rachel Bayman, who has a fantastic new record out called Common Nation of Sorrow, which I'm really looking forward to talking about. Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'd love to talk about the record, but I'm also really keen to talk about sort of a bit of your background, because although it's a record of songs, you actually started out as a fiddle player. Yeah, that's Uh, correct. I started playing a lot of uh, bluegrass and old time fiddle. That was kind of my main thing for 10 years, I guess, until I kind of found songwriting and got a little bit obsessed with that. So now I kind of do both, although my project is mainly about songwriting. And I've heard you talk before about sort of um, studying anthropology and playing the fiddle mm. and sort of seeing the two almost as branches of the same thing in a way. Yeah. That's a fascinating idea, just the idea, because particularly in American music, the fiddle is maybe the instrument of American folk music that crosses a lot of genres, a lot of different styles, a lot of different regional mm-hmm. things. And the history of where all that comes from in the music yeah. is also a big part of it. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think the fiddle is actually kind of like a quite an international folk musician, uh, sorry, a folk instrument that crosses a lot of international uh, boundaries because it exists obviously in so many different countries and a lot of times in like slightly varied forms, um, but it's almost everywhere. And um, in America, I would almost say the banjo is maybe more like that unique thing that we have here that has made such a huge impact on the sound of specifically American folk music. Because when I think about fiddle music from the British Isles and what changed once it came to the States and what like kind of created the the impetus for the development of old time rhythms and um, and then eventually bluegrass, you know, sound, a lot of that has to do with the banjo and the influence of um, black Americans that were brought over um, as slaves and the way that those African rhythms and influences have interplayed with the the fiddle music. It's so fascinating to me. And that's really like what makes it such a unique melting pot music, I think. Yeah, this, it's easy to think of um, American folk music as being a product of the British Isles and they just traveled over and settled and changed a bit. But it's yeah. so much, so much, and particularly the way people talk and write about it now versus 10, 15 years ago, that that mixture of European and African is such a sort of key element of it. It's Yeah, it's so key. I mean, you can even hear it in the way that when you play um, English, Irish, Scottish fiddle music, the very much emphasis is on the one and the three. And when you come to America, the emphasis is on the two and the four. So the shift to the backbeat, it's like that's so fundamental, you know. So I love how that stuff interplays with, you know, cultural change and cultural influence and how you can literally hear it in the music yeah I, as a brit it's particularly interesting talking to like american musicians about bluegrass and old-time music because i'm experiencing it as an outsider and mm-hmm. so i'm fascinated in what what the regional variations are and why and why some fiddlers play this way and some play that way and it's an endless yeah. sort of little rabbit hole you can go down absolutely and how did um, sort of 10 years of primarily being an instrumentalist, How what changed you into a songwriter? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, it's a path that I didn't really, I guess some people have these aha moments and kind of make a decision and make some big change. And for me, it was much more just following a natural progression of um what was inspiring me and and what I wanted to make. So I was working as a fiddle player and uh, I started a band with my friend Christian Settlemeyer that was very much based on fiddles. It was called Ten String Symphony, a duo and very heady, uh, very arrangement based. And um, largely I played fiddle and some banjo, but the the premise of the band was kind of all about creating full arrangements using just this really stripped down instrumentation. So it was really a study of both the duo form and also like the huge capacity of what you could do with these instruments. And I feel like all of that time spent with the fiddle, you know, it, it really served me and I grew a lot, but it was also really hard to stay in those parameters. Like everything had to be so through arranged and like, there wasn't a lot of room for, 
um, breathing within that music because you had so little to work with, I guess. And, um, but I did write a lot for that band. Um, the song forms were quite different because I was kind of writing for this. It almost like if you had a really progressive string quartet or something. Um, and, but I definitely, it, it got me interested in songwriting and um, I was also having moved to Nashville. I was also surrounded by a lot of really amazing songwriters and a lot of people that were very much, obsessed with um the craft of songwriting and I think when I finished school I didn't really realize how much I was using like all of my degrees and all my work in school was very writing based and I think like when I stopped doing that there was kind of this outlet missing and um I guess by the time I was writing for the shame album I felt like maybe I had something to say at that point um and uh, yeah, so it's just it's just been kind of a natural progression. And I try to only work on things that I feel really inspired to do because I don't want to I don't know. I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> Your artistic inspiration is really precious. So I feel like I I try to really honor that. It's interesting, isn't it, that the the, the almost sort of acoustic music that's coming out of america in some forms which is almost like chamber music it's very arranged very kind of the sort of following that tradition from mm -hmm. um uncommon ritual onwards there's a lot of that around with hawktail punch brothers people mm -hmm. like wes call but there's a lot of, and it mm -hmm. seems to sit perfectly well alongside songs and more songwriter based approach and they they mesh totally it's a fascinating kind of confluence of stuff it's not one or the other there's there's a lot of both around at the moment it feels like yeah i think it's you know just like anything in art it's like there's a big spectrum and some of it, you know, it, it mixes really beautifully in the middle. Some of it leans heavily one way or the other. So, And like sort of coming on to the new record, Combination of Sorrow, which is very much a song-based thing. Um, I love what you said about, so I'm just going to read a quick quote that, um, that I read. You said, in some ways, this is a homecoming project for me. I wanted to explore these songs based on who and where I am right now with the town and the people who raised me musically. Um, and that's a, Oh, you're talking about inspiration. There's, that's a whole yeah. rich seam of inspiration there. Um, and I presume you're talking about Nashville when you talk about the town that raised you musically. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there's all of this stuff in the content of the songs that um, I talk about all the time. But then also, I think there's also the whole side of making a record where you have to decide what you want to do with it musically, like how you want to set up the parameters of your production landscape. And um, since I was producing this one myself and that was a really conscious decision, I was trying to do something that I felt that I had like fully had a hold of, I think with previous records, because I've been working with someone else, I've really been trying to push myself to grow and try new things and uh, a lot of new sounds and, and skills that I didn't yet quite have. And I mean, that's an amazing opportunity to grow, obviously, but when I'm in charge of the project myself, I wanted to make sure that I already had everything that I was working with. Um, and I really did want it to feel like a bit of a homecoming. I, I worked, I recorded it in Nashville, like with my favorite engineer, Sean, Sean Sullivan at my favorite studio that I work in all the time for other people's records. And, um, you know, was able to call so many different musicians to play on it that I've worked with over the years. And, it's producing is really fun. It's like having, you know, a fantasy football team. Cause you can be like, if I had the perfect band for this one song, what would it be? And you can change it every song. And um, of course you want it to come out cohesive, but um, as long as you can kind of keep an eye on that, the possibilities are endless. And that's why it's so, so fun to do. And the, have I got this right? The previous record was recorded in Australia, wasn't it? Yeah. The previous record cycles, I, I made that in Australia with, um, one of my favorite musicians uh, from Melbourne named Olivia Halley. She has uh, had a band called Opep and you might be familiar with Pepita who plays the mandolin um, listeners of this podcast might know her cause she spends a lot of time in Scotland and England these days with her band reign of animals. And um, anyway, they're an incredible band and Olivia um, worked on that record with me. And that was very much trying to learn from her and, and capture the sound of that scene. And it was really cool. And, and presumably being in Australia, you don't have a bunch of Nashville people you can call in for individual tracks. Exactly. Yeah, that that record was about doing more with less. I think that, that record was about trusting um, simplicity in my own, like, abilities. 
and just it, it's actually i mean it's a little bit more indie rock leaning but it's quite stripped down in comparison um whereas this new record is a lot of lush layers more similar to what we did with um shame that kind of style that andrew marlin has of producing for watch house where it's um very like soundscapey and so mm. it's like those were both huge learning experiences for me and i tried to kind of take a bit of of both in making this record and did you, did you have a sort of clear vision then at the beginning of sort of how you wanted it to sound? I did. I made like a whole playlist, which I've since put made public, um, like on Spotify and Tidal, uh, of all these albums that I felt like the song had arrived at its perfect home sonically. So I tried to pick out a lot of times when you hear a record, you know, there's like one or two songs that just feels like it, it just really sang, like so, someone really nailed it. In, in getting it in the right context. So I tried to pick out all of those songs, like kind of in the realm of the musicians I was working with and the sounds I was trying to get. And, and I was like, I want to make a whole album of these songs that just sit perfectly. I mean, of course, everyone wants to do that with every album, but that's kind of what I was thinking. And um, I also worked with my friend Riley Calcagno and, and um, his influence is, is all over the album. He was playing banjo and, and guitar and, um, I think that working with him a little bit on pre-production, cause I hit this like panic moment where I was like, I know exactly what I want to do. And now I need to hear it to make sure. And who can I call to play all these parts so I can play along and be like, is this what we want? And he was the perfect person to do that with. And so, yeah, there was kind of these different parameters, but you also have to be totally open cause you never know how it's going to sound. You might need to change something in the moment. And it's really, you know, just from my experience of the record, I saw you play over here with Sierra Hull and Justin Moses um, just yeah. before Christmas. And so obviously I heard some of the songs, just you with a banjo or a guitar or, um, and then to hear the sort of the sonic landscape of it all was really interesting because they're the kind of songs you could just sing with a guitar and presumably very yeah. often do. Was it, was it what you expected or did you find it a little surprising? uh yeah it was it was it was inter not like surprising to interesting just in a kind of oh okay yeah okay because there's, i think there's an expectation with acoustic singers songwriters when you've heard them that you're going to get a record of them and a guitar and and i'd heard a little bit of your older stuff before that um right and it's just yeah there's because there's so many choices to be made and particularly given mm -hmm. that the nature of the record is like there's it's it's a political record in terms of like a personal political, it's not sort of, mm -hmm. sort of taking a side necessarily, but the themes are political, even if they're about how yeah. they affect individuals on a day-to-day -day level. Okay. Um, yeah. And it could easily be kind of, if if you think of it as a protest record, which I can't imagine you do necessarily, but there's then an image you have of that, of a sort of strident acoustic right. sound. Like and, a, kind of a yeah. like, and Woody Guthrie sound. And there's just, uh, you'd say it's almost sort of soundscapey in places and very mm -hmm. sort of has some very soft edges to it. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that that was your, uh, was your interpretation of it. I definitely wanted it to feel really approachable. I mean, the idea of commonality in general, you know, involves making everyone feel that they can approach and be a part of something. So. I know that's one of the things I found fascinating when I read a bit about the record because obviously there is a lot of political content and I've heard you say that you sort of want the record to maybe inspire some activism um, mm -hmm. but there's, a, there's something that you'd said and I think in another interview I heard and you said to me political conversations on the internet are largely harmful and not really helpful so I've shifted mm -hmm. my idea about what is a helpful form of communication and songs and art are always to me going to be the best way to get something across and this is the bit I love without shutting someone down. Mm -hmm. So an approachable, like, you know, welcoming, warm sound to deliver those kind of lyrics is a very interesting approach to me. Yeah. It's also to me a lot about like writing through storytelling and writing through emotion. I think like if you think about having a conversation with someone, um, let's say you're sitting down with someone that, you know, really doesn't share the same beliefs as you do about, um, I don't know, whatever issue, maybe something that's a little more nuanced than like I'm racist or, you know, like there are these kind of issues that we just run into, but I think a lot of them are rooted in this sort of feeling anger and feeling like, um, 
you don't have any options in life. But if someone says to you, like, well, I don't think we should have universal health care. It's like, that's like a very difficult place to have a conversation. Whereas if someone says, I feel really frustrated with my life. I feel like I've disappointed my family and I can never live up to their expectations. It's like, you're never going to have an argument about that. That's just how someone feels. You're going to feel connected to them. You're going to want to know more about why. And then when you end up talking about healthcare, there's going to be so much more empathy there and so much more ability to see someone as a person. So I think with songs it's and any form of art, it's really important to infuse your message with emotion and story and not make it feel like a, a brick wall. You know, it's like, to me, I always try to come back to this idea. I'm like, well, I, there is a time and place for political rhetoric, but like, I'm not a politician. I don't have to have an, uh, you know, an A to D set out agenda to tell people what they should think. Like there is room for nuance and like the reality of life and how people experience things, which is a gift of art, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's really true. There's so few things that we have like in the media we consume that has the space for the actual nuance of a debate. It's sort of, you get somebody in from one side and somebody in from the other side and hope they fall out because it's entertaining TV and it's not an actual conversation. It's also just like, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's also just the um, kind of reality that people are not even tuning into the same thing. So it's almost like there's no real thing that everyone's watching collectively, which is a huge issue, I think. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that idea of storytelling because songs have that ability that a short story has to just mm. show you something and not tell you anything, to so just turn your head and go look at that for a minute and leave you to interpret that in whatever way you want, whereas longer-form things like a movie or a novel sometimes end up answering the questions for you. A song or a short story can just direct your attention somewhere and leave the rest to you, mm-hmm. and it's a really nice way to experience a question rather than an answer almost. That's a really interesting interpretation. I, I love short stories and I do totally correlate them with songs. I've always thought more like, oh, and then the novel's like the full album. <laughs> but I see what you're saying. Like sometimes it hasn't too much of a conclusion or too much of an answer, you know, but um, but yeah, I don't think it has to. Like, did you see um did you see After Sun? I didn't. That's a movie, um, it's a beautiful movie, but uh, it's definitely a, a, a question. <laughs> there is no resolution, but you feel like, oh. So, yeah, I think I think a great movie or a great book can also do that. But, uh, but of course, there's a lot of um, variance in movies and books. It's just like maybe there's more um, short stories or don't have a lot of commercial value. So they might maintain that kind of nuance more so than like a genre fiction where you like really want to follow the or a Hollywood movie that has like a very intense um, expectation of what people want to see. Yeah. And that, um, what you were saying about, um, about stories and emotion and sort of personal giving somebody some emotion to latch onto rather than a sort of mm-hmm. opi- opinion almost. So one of my favorite songwriters is Steve Earle. You can take mm-hmm. an issue like the death penalty and he can write a song like Billy Austin, which is from the point of view of somebody on death row. You can mm-hmm. also write a song um, like well, Alice Unit 1, which is the same thing, but ripped from the point of view of somebody's job is to administer the sort of lethal yeah. injection. And he's not telling you anything that you should think. He's just going, look at how two people experience this thing, which he has a very strong yeah. opinion about. And he just yeah. shows you some character and a story and a, you know, a way into thinking about it in a different way. Yeah, I think that's the whole art of it. I think that is um, what makes a great song. And I think that this, just listening to to this record, just songs like uh, "She Don't Know What to Sing About Anymore" and just those, they're they're there's there's a lot in them, and yet they're also pretty simple and delicate. And you know, there's there's mm-hmm. they have layers, and and the, you can spend time with them and sit with them and get as much as you want out of them but they're also yeah. very immediate as well. The layers thing is really interesting with songs because, um, I mean, thank you for that. Those kind words. I think with songs, you 
you know, the great song, because people don't always, well, first of all, I mean, I'm a lyrical listener, but a lot of people aren't. So uh, you also have to convey musically what's happening so that someone can feel the song to some extent without even totally hearing the lyrics. Um, and, you know, for someone who's so lyric, like myself, like I, I don't think anyone's ever going to get the full extent of the song without hearing lyrics. Cause that's really what I'm about, but, um, but hopefully they get some of it enough to kind of want to be interested in more. And then you have the chorus, which is like, it, it needs to be able to catch people because that might be the only thing they remember the first time they hear the song. Um, so it's like that, the craft of making those layers of a song work is so fascinating to me. And I think can be really, it's different for every song and it's really like a lifelong pursuit of getting that, getting that perfected. And it, it feels so good when you feel like you've gotten close to that and people are going to listen to it. You know, I fall in love with songs and the best thing is when you listen to it for the 10th time and you hear something new and you're like, Oh my gosh, it's so smart. You know, I was listening to Tyler Childers Gemini the other day and I always thought that was just like a cute thing about him being wild and kind of all over the place. And then there's this whole thing about like how the Gemini is a twin sign. And he's like, they'll cut me in half and they'll send part back home and the other half on the road. And I was like, that is so brilliant. Like he took this kind of like really um, popular cultural reference. Like people are obsessed with horoscopes right now. And he could have just left it there, you know, but he kind of went deeper into what the star sign actually means and what it means for him. And then he was like, and now I'm going to turn the star sign into a physical manifestation of me. And I'm going to talk about how I have these two sides. I don't know. It's just I love when you find things like that in songs. Yeah. And it's that kind of thing where you listen and think, wow, like I wonder if they meant that. And of course they did, because people think about this yeah, stuff and then people did. are hiding yeah, little totally. clues for you and. Yeah. But there's there's nuance in there that ninety yeah. percent of people won't even hear or see or yeah. find. But if you find it, obviously it's been placed there for you to excavate at some yeah. point. Exactly. exactly. And it's uh, totally so true what you say about songs. Can, like there's a song like Wichita Line Man is such a evocative song, even if you don't listen to the lyrics. But if you mm. do listen to the lyrics, they still don't make a huge amount of sense. They're not like a, <laughs> a really clear narrative, but it's a very like you feel a place and a, a certain kind of, you can feel the, the warmth of the air almost. And a and that's sort of a song yeah. can do that without, and then if you add the lyrical content on it, that sinks in and draws you yeah. further and further. You the know, setting, you know, the music yeah. is a lot of it is about the setting and putting you in the right place to experience the song. And that's, and that's fascinating because there's a song lovers and leavers on this record that, mm. that you wrote as a love song. That came to mm. be something else to you because mm -hmm. you talk about um having been diagnosed with bipolar between yeah. having written the song and recording the yeah. song and and that that's fascinating this that is... it comes to mean something more to you with a different context it's it was totally wild actually like i it just shows me how important these creative pursuits are for everyone because even if you're not doing something professionally, if you don't know how you feel about something or if you can't understand what you think about something or what you feel about something and you try to create, it will often come out and show you what it is that you're trying to understand. And I guess for me, it was like, I thought that I was writing about this like romantic situation and I was actually trying to understand what was happening in my brain and my body. And I kind of told myself what was happening, you know, I mean, of course I had a, an actual diagnosis, but that was later after, you know, having to be like said, Hey, like, have you thought about this? And then when I go back and I look at the song and I'm like, there's no middle, only highs, only lows. That's literally bipolar disorder. Like that is the definition. And it's like right there in the songs. So it's like all the clues are there. So I don't know. I think that's amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Cause that's, that's like something in me helping me, you know? Uh, yeah. And that's, that's fascinating. That sense that the, the process of creating, it's not like you have 
a thing and you're just giving birth to it. It's like you're creating mm-hmm. it as you go. I mean, I learned that a while ago about having it. I used to think a conversation was two people telling each other what they thought about stuff. And it's right. not a conversation as you're working out what you feel about stuff. Like you, the thing that you actually yes. mean is something you say and then go away and think, that's what I think. We'll be right back with you just after this. Bluegrass Jam Along is proud to be sponsored by Collins Guitars and Mandolins. If you're attending the NAMM show in January, stop by the Collins booth to say hello to the team, get hands-on with their selection of customised acoustics and electrics, and check out some exciting new prototypes they're working on for 2024. They'll also have a few of their world-class artists on hand demoing various instruments. And if you can't attend, don't forget to follow their Instagram and Facebook accounts throughout the show for photos, videos, and the latest news. Collins guitars are hand-built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If one of your 2024 resolutions is to improve as a musician, Peghead Nation is the place to go. They have 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music. Courses cover bluegrass, old time, Irish music and swing, plus lessons dedicated to improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 a month and you can add more for $10. Try any course free for a month with the promo code JAMALONG. Make 2024 a year of more music at pegheadnation.com. You know what? If more people understood that, conversations would be much better. Yeah. <laughs> because I actually, I totally agree with you. And I think that a lot of people do think that conversations are two people telling each other what they think. And that is something that actually drives me so crazy. Like I can get really exhausted by people quickly. And that is the number one thing that like will make me just shut down. And um, if somebody just talks at me and I just don't feel like there's any, it's like, why are we even talking? (laughs) You've already like, you already know all this, what you want to say. And I don't feel like you're getting anything back from me. So might as well just not. So I think that's um, a beautiful observation that I'm going to steal and explain to people <laughs> from now on. <laughs> and it's, it's sort of come up in conversations about bluegrass and old time and playing tunes with mm. people and how music is a conversation and particularly improvised music like a lot of bluegrass and old time is and can be. That if you sit down with somebody and they just play you a tune and all the licks they know and they've decided what they're going to play and they just deliver you all yeah. their licks. Yeah. That's nowhere near as much fun as somebody playing you because with, with conversation I'm using phrases and words that I use every day I'm not inventing a new phrase every time I speak I'm largely talking yeah. cliches and accepted things yeah. but you're able to express some new thoughts in between those and that musical conversation as a way of generating a thing that happens in that moment then it's gone is also I think that's one of the reasons I love this kind of music is because you've got that song your play and yeah and just and this it's all it's something that's self renewing every time it happens yeah i think that's a really astute observation and i think it's also something that can separate um highly commercial music from music that has a lot of life in it no matter the genre but sometimes you hear music that is crafted for commercial success and it's like they already knew what they were going to make before they tried making it. And it's like, you're just being told the song. (laughs) Like it's kind of what you're saying about the conversation. But I think anytime with, if you talk about jamming or um, which is such a, obviously a huge part of these traditional um, music forms, like a lot of it is about interacting with people and meeting them where they're at. So if you go to, if you decide you want to just, I mean, a lot of times in, in Nashville, it's just, it's a normal thing to say, Hey, do you want to come over and play some tunes? And, you know, that's true all over the world with these styles. And, um, you just, you show up and you might have a couple of things in mind, but like, it might just take a very different turn musically. And if you're not able to adapt to that, it's going to be really unfun. Like you have to just say, okay, what are you playing? And try to respond to that and let it influence your own playing in that setting. And we kind of joke sometimes, um, in Nashville that like, if you go to a party, that's not like a, a jam party, you kind of don't know how to interact with people because like you get so used to translating that to the musical. It's like very, it's like 
an easier way for musicians sometimes to have a conversation um, because, you know, people get shy or you don't know what to bring up and um, you can just be like, let's play a tune. <laughs> and it's, yeah, that's really interesting because you are also having a conversation at the same time. Like if somebody's playing yeah. back and somebody else is playing the tune, both of which are improvised in some form. Yeah. Like with a conversation, I speak, you speak, I speak, you speak. We talk at the same time. Nobody knows, but with yeah. music, you are talking at the same time. And so there's just a removal of the transactional nature of it as well. So it's a, mm. just such a lovely way to communicate with somebody at the same time as them. Yeah, absolutely. And I find it really interesting that um, as a songwriter who sort of came to songwriting um, after years of being an instrumentalist and being a very thoughtful kind of creative songwriter and, you, you know, very connected mm. to what that means to you, I always find it fascinating when songwriters choose to put a cover on their record. And you've obviously got John Hartford's Self Made Man on here, which thematically mm -hmm. obviously fits with the rest of the record pretty strong. But I'm really interested yeah. why that why that ended up on there. Yeah, well, it was kind of a um, it is a cover, but it's also something that I kind of reworked and added to. So in a way, it's like um, I wanted to represent it, you know, so I just I found it and. I just thought this song is so brilliant and a lot of people don't know about it. It's not like a very common Hartford song. I think largely because the original feels quite unfinished. It's like a fragment. Um, it's not something that you would jam on because there's like no chorus, you know? So I, um, I wanted to kind of like finish it out so it could kind of have a new life out in the world. And um, thematically, it just was so, so on brand for this record. And I love the fact that this song that was written so long ago is still maybe even more relevant. And I love feeling that connection to John Hartford as a songwriter that, you know, like he believed these similar things to me and that, that means a lot to me. And um, so, yeah, that's why, that's why I chose that song, but I do feel like there is something to be said for having a break from your own voice on a record, whether that's through co-writes or covers. And I've had like one or two covers on every album I've made. And often people respond to those the best, um, maybe because they like, well, maybe they're just better, but like also because they just kind of stick out a little bit because it's a little bit different, you know, it's like mm. a, it's a break from my style. Um, co-writes can do that too. So I don't know, like you always want a record to feel cohesive and like true to you, but I also think there's something about embracing that collaborative nature that can add a little sparkle to an album and just kind of mix it up a little bit. Mm. And it is really sort of, um, I, it's not a song I knew before, but there's just that framing of, like I, we've had years, we've had decades now of being sort of conditioned to believe that we're individuals and we're not a society yeah. and that we are and that anybody who gets anywhere has done it through hard work and pulling themselves up by the bootstraps yeah. and if they can do it you can do it and um it's a really frustrating narrative when we're all in all of it sure. together and we're all part of it. and just yeah. it's such a beautiful phrasing of that and, i know uh, I, love that. Of... I love that about john hartford he always does things with humor and humility it's like he is it's literally a question even though you get the vibe of the song, he's not really telling you anything. He's just saying, hmm, I wonder how many, men, you know, like it's 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 exactly what we were talking about, like leaving the question in the song. Um, and and it's funny, you know, and it's like it's I don't know, it has it has that magic, that John Hartford magic for sure. And I think both my country and your country have been through a period of having somebody in charge who very much was about their own brand and their own individual mm -hmm. and that narrative marvelousness that <laughs> and, yeah. and that and so it very much is of now but songs that remind you that maybe the cult of individualism isn't all it's cracked up to be are a really nice thing at this point in time totally and i think it's something we all need even um there's these really blatant examples obviously like trump being like I'm self-made when he inherited all this money and, you know, has always had all this privilege and it's just obviously so false. But I also think it plays into the idea that the cult of individualism, I think everyone feeling that they need to be their own brand and their own kind of um, commercial 
export in this weird way. And I think like we've all, well, I know that I feel that pressure all the time as a musician. And I know that everyone feels that pressure um, on the internet. And I think we're starting to feel like that comes with this, like this big high because all of a sudden you're somebody and only you are that person. But that also comes with this immense anxiety and pressure. And I think that as a society, we're starting to be like, actually, maybe we don't all want to be, sorry, this cat, this is, I'm not in my house, but this cat's going crazy. Um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's not, maybe we all just want to be part of a community. Maybe there's something to be said for not being the leader of your own show all the time. And um, yeah, so it's definitely something I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah, it's fine. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but that just the social media world where everybody wants to be an influencer has sort of turned mm -hmm. us into, it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier about conversations and, and listening versus just saying like, we, it's sort of turned yes. us all into broadcasters where what we do is we put things out yes. and we're all furiously going through our apps to see how many likes we've had and we're not looking at anybody else's content. We're just going like in the little fruit machine of social media, have I had a payout? And it's it's all, it turns communication back into a one-way thing, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. I think that's also part of the polarity, you know, that we're experiencing, that everything's one way and that every, everything's a statement rather than a conversation. So hmm. I totally agree. Yeah. With and the John Harper things, really, I I um, spoke to you really briefly when I came to interview Sierra in London yeah. before Christmas. And I remember you saying at the time that your sort of two musical heroes were John Hartford and Gillian Welch as well. Yeah, I do. I do love Gillian Welch. Um, I think that was more of like a, I've kind of more recently been drawn to, um, I think a huge influence on that um, Cycles album was Courtney Barnett and some of the like more indie songwriters. I've been trying to kind of draw on that. I see this like parallel in the conversational songwriting of those. Um but yeah, Gillian Welch, I think, has become an act like a bit of an accidental influence because I just I mean, I absolutely adore Gillian Welch. Um, but people just started saying she was my influence and that I sounded like her. And then I was like, oh, shoot, do I sound too much like Gillian Welch? And so it's become this weird circular thing. And I'm like, well, I don't want to deny that because I love Gillian Welch, but it, it was never something that I strived for, you know. It's interesting because she also has that there's a combination of sort of softness and edges as well mm. like she totally has a fairly soft vocal delivery and the music's often quite down key but the harmonies they choose to sing and the notes that Dave chooses mm -hmm. to play are always going to poke you out of that it's not like a lovely soft cloud all the time it's there's always something coming to just nudge you in the ear and go mm, and the not so easy that way too they're like they sound really pretty and then you're like oof you know, they're, they're, they're heartbreaking and they're intense and they really don't shy around, shy away from realities. You know, they're very, um, they're pokey. They're real. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's, I, I, it's one of the things I really enjoyed about this record is it has like that soundscape equality. It's all, Oh, and this is maybe a lazy word to use for it, but it's almost cinematic in places. Mm. I don't even know what I mean by cinematic, but just something that evokes Ooh, that's, that's a sort a of word. I, I think a canvas that's... and a thought. Of, yeah, and but at the same time, it's not um, there to give you an easy ride either. Mm. It's like there's a, there's a softness there to draw you in, mm. and then it's a, it's a fascinating combination of. It's like you were saying before about um, about layers and the chorus or the hook of a song needs to get somebody's attention, but yeah. you can't sustain that all the way through a song. Once you've got somebody's attention, you can show them something more subtle. And the, that's the sort of layers element of these songs that I love. It's just, you can dive in and in and in and Thank sort of you. keep going. I think um, there's some credit to be given to Tucker for some of the cinematic qualities of the mix. Um, I think that's very, in his wheelhouse, he's, he's always able to really create a soundscape to match the emotion of the, the song and you know it's like mixing is such a strange and beast but it's like so incredibly important to the outcome of the record so I'm happy that I'm grateful he was able to take on that project and so looking back on the process the the sort of self-produced element of it um did that sort of was there anything that surprised you about that or anything you learned as a result of doing it yeah i mean i 
said to my husband, I was like, I am so glad I did this, but I really never want to do it again for myself. Like I, I did it because I want to produce. I've done some production projects and it's something that I want to do more of, but it's very different when you're producing someone else. Cause there's still two teammates, you know, it's you and the artist or the multiple artists. Um, and I always feel really good about doing that because there's a lot of feedback, you know, like I might make a suggestion and they're like, mm, I don't know about that. And then you have to interrogate it and um, you're listening to them play and you can give feedback listening in the, you know, outside of yourself. And then when it got to the down to the line um, with this record, I was the producer. So for the whole first week and a half of tracking, it was very focused on the band. Like I was in there doing scratch take some vocals and everything with the band and trying to get the feel right. But I was only listening to everybody else. And so I spent, and I was sick, so I couldn't really use any vocal takes from that time. There was one we kept, the uh, Old Songs Never Die is the original live vocal. And it you can hear that my nose is like completely stuffed up, but it was just, it was such a great vibe. We just were like, we gotta use it. Wabi sabi. But uh, the, the, whole band, you know, I was like very confident in, in my element. I was like, no, this, we need to do this. That's great. Let's keep that. Let's fix that. And I felt like, yeah, I got this. And then everybody left and it was just me and Sean. And I'm like recording these vocals, recording these strings, recording these banjos. And I'm like, how's it sound? And he's like, I'm not the producer, you know, that I have to run in and listen and be like, oh God. Okay. I like that. You know, it's like, it's so hard to do that for yourself. So it was actually recording my own parts. That was the hardest thing about producing and that makes sense. And like, it should, I, but I, I definitely kind of learned, I don't know why I didn't think about it, but that was, yeah, that was really hard. And I would not want to do that again. I think you really benefit from having someone outside of you hear your parts and, and give feedback, someone who you trust musically. So, and I also think that it's a huge opportunity to have a mentor. So like there's, you know, when you're, working as an independent musician, you're not, there's not a lot of time or money to kind of take classes or lessons. Like you're kind of always hustling. So when you do put this huge investment into making a new record, it can also be an opportunity in investing into one of your heroes, spending time on your music and kind of mentoring you how to do it. And I definitely learned so much making the previous two records and some of the 10 string symphony albums as well. We did with um, like when we did with Chris Drever and um, that mm. was a huge mentoring moment. So um I did kind of get that a little bit working with Tucker on the mix. That was like kind of how I tried to get that in this situation. But I do think that like, it is a, kind of a, an awesome opportunity for that, that I would want to take advantage of in the future. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Is that you never able to hear yourself as other people do. And so, yeah, like there's, there's ups and downs to that, but the idea that sometimes even as an instrumentalist, you know, somebody going, go back in and do another take, come on. You know, mm -hmm. there's something more there than that. You, you've mm -hmm. done all the, you've done it all right. It all sounds great. It's all nice and clean. Well done. Now go and do one that sounds like it's got some feeling in it. And it's, yeah. you know, yeah. just, you can't do that to yourself in the same way. I, funny that you say that I actually find it to be, usually it's the opposite problem. You sit in there and you, you do it 17 times and you still think that there's something better. And actually on take eight, you totally nailed it. And you're just being like insane and, and you've, gone too far and there's like diminishing returns. So a lot of it is with other people. I feel like I can do a really good job of finding that point at which they sound perfectly like themselves and not like they're trying to do something more with myself it's hearing... harder, you know, <laughs> I remember hearing a story and I can't remember if it was Bella Fleck that said it, or it was somebody else talking about working with him that you'd get Tony Rice in to do guitar solos and Tony do a solo and then put the guitar back in the case and Bella would have to go, could you, could you do another one? Yeah. All right then, you know, and then he'd listen back and he'd realize the first one was perfect, but it's mm -hmm. just, you know. Exactly. Exactly. I think, um, also I think you just quickly after listening to so much in the studio, you quickly realize that, you know, it's very rare that you get something better than after the third or fourth take. Like it's really like, there is a point because you just, you're just overthinking it. Then, you know, you spent way too much time in it and you're, when you repeat something over and over, you start avoiding the things that are most natural because you've already done them so many times. So yeah, I do feel like, um, you don't want to over, over record. I know in the movies, they always portray it like 
whenever there's a producer shot in the movies, it's like the genius producer. And then like the person's in there singing and then they're like, I'm done. I can't do anymore. And the producer's like, think about your dead father and like da, 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 do it one more time. And like, it's like their whole job is to sort of like beat this person into creating the best take ever. But I think in my experience, it's much more about getting people to relax into themselves and accept imperfections that actually make their stuff amazing. Yeah. And that, that applies to so many areas of life, like just mm -hmm. the being able to be vulnerable enough to mm -hmm. not exactly. be perfect, but say exactly. something real in the process. Yes. Of, I mean, it, it's sort of a different version of this, but I have guitar lessons with Brian Sutton through Artist Works, and I was expecting like lots of instruction on which the cool notes to play are. And how. Mm -hmm. there's not much of that, there's, but there's a lot of talk about how to just approach things as a human and bring yourself and not be afraid to do the things you hear rather than trying to sound like, you know, a bluegrass guitarist or whatever, to be sound like you within that world. And it's, it's hard to do sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it makes total sense because if you're trying to play the cool notes that Brian Sutton told you to play, you're just going to sound like a weird mimic of Brian Sutton. You know what I mean? Like you're not going to sound like you're bringing anything original to the table. So you kind of have to feel like you can find and decide on the cool notes yourself, which is the hard thing because it involves like you said vulnerability um confidence in what you're putting out there um being okay with somebody not liking it or not agreeing or you know and, and in, a, in a genre like bluegrass i think there's so it's so narrow in terms of the the like initial beginnings of it that there's a lot of fear about doing things wrong and right so um it's i think that's really cool what you've gotten out of those lessons it's just really interesting hearing what you were saying before about um, as soon as a few people started saying that you sounded like you're influenced by Gillian Welch, <laughs> your initial and immediate reaction is like, okay, well, I'm backing off from that then. Like, uh, yeah, well, I was just worried because I was like, oh, God, like, I don't want people to, you don't want to sound like an imitator, you know what I mean? And I, and I, it was mainly because I guess like I have put it out there so much, like I've been so actively um, trying to, to take certain things from like John Hartford that I expected that. And I, and I try to credit that. Um, but with Gillian Welch, I mean, she's alive and making music still. So it's like, and also because she's a female artist, so you could actually be like, Oh, too imitative. You know, like, I think I sound naturally so different than John Hartford that it's never going to be like imitative really. And, um, but it's mostly funny because I just never put that out there. And then people just started saying it about me. And now people say, one of your biggest influences is Gillian Welch, isn't it? And I'm like, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I guess it is. I just never thought that. Yeah, it's funny, though, isn't it? It's that, again, just seeing yourself through the lens of other people seeing you yeah. and seeing what they see is always fascinating. Yeah, totally. Um, I have a friend who everyone constantly is telling him he sounds just like Paul Simon. And he gets so annoyed and I'm like, Paul Simon's amazing. And he's like, I know, but like, I'm me. I'm not Paul Simon. And I'm like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> like, even, to the, even to the extent I've got a 10 year old kid. And when he was at uh, nursery and it was two or three, there'd be a couple of days I'd go to collect him and somebody I didn't know would open the door and go, oh, you must be Fred's dad. Uh, Cause we looked and I, I look at him and I think, oh, you don't look anything like me. I don't look anything totally, like you, but totally. other people go, oh, that's your kid. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. They see that line even when you don't. Yeah. So, um, so what's next? I presume you've got a lot of touring coming up. On yeah. The back of the record. Kind of like a halfway point in my U S tour. So I did a big UK tour in March and, um, this month I've been in the Southeast of the U S and the Midwest. And, um, in a week or so I'm headed to the Northeast and then the Pacific Northwest and then Colorado. So the UK you can do in three weeks, the U S you kind of need like eight. So, um, I guess I didn't, I mean, to be fair, I really didn't cover all of the UK. I was just in Scotland and England, but, um, it's just huge. And the distance between shows is, is long and lots of people to see and hopefully share the record with. And I'm hoping you've got a better guitar case. Cause when I saw you, your lovely pre-war guitar had a crack in it. Well, I have to plug the amazing Colton guitar. 
Carlton cases because I have a Carlton now and it's flown uh, safely a number of times and it's been hauled all over the place and it's doing great. And the folks at pre-war guitar company fixed it up for me. So I have a lot of uh, good friends and supporters that help get me back on the road. So props to them. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, good luck with the tour and with the record. I absolutely love it. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I've really enjoyed the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for your patience. Um, rescheduling when my van broke down and I uh, appreciate you having me. And thanks for the wonderful conversation. It really, truly, it truly felt like a conversation. So great with that. <laughs> there we go. We did what we were telling people to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.